Hello, and welcome to Maintaining Relationship Status and Open Discussion. My name is Anna Costales, and I'm the Resource and Dissemination Manager here at AUCD. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Before we begin, I'd like to address a few logistical details. First, we'll provide a brief introduction of the SIG and our speakers. Following the speaker's presentation, there'll be time for questions. Because of the number of participants, your audio lines will be muted throughout the call. However, you can unmute your lines at the end for questions and answers for the discussion. And you can also ask questions in the chat box on your webinar console. You may send chat to the whole audience or the presenters only. This entire webinar is being recorded and will be available at AUCD's webinar library at the end of the event. There will also be a short evaluation survey at the close of the webinar. We invite you to provide feedback on the webinar and also to provide suggestions for future topics. I will now pass the mic over to co-chair, to the co-chair of the Sexual Health SIG, Lindsay Mullis, who will talk a little about the SIG. Lindsay? Hey, thank you so much, Anna. And if you want to go ahead and pull up our slides, uh, we'll go ahead and get those shared. I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your afternoon to join us today for the Maintaining Relationship Status and Open Discussion uh, here um, with AUCD, hosted by the Sexual Health Special Interest Group. And so again, it is an open discussion. And so I know everybody's muted for now, but as we get into talking through the discussion, about uh, maintaining relationship status. We really wanna hear from you all. So um, can you guys see the slide deck? Perfect. Great, so this is myself and Julie and our other coach here, Lindsay. And we are excited to have you all here. We together co-chair the Sexual Health and Special Interest Group at AUCD. And our goal is really to connect people across the network to each other, to share resources, talking about disability and sexuality. When we say sexuality, we're talking about that broader definition of sexuality. So thinking about sexual health, um, interpersonal violence and abuse, as well as creating relationships that are healthy. Um, and so really education is a big part of that and a big big effort of what the SIG does is just talking to each other and sharing the great work that we're doing across the network and even for um, outside of the university network outside of AUCD. So we're really excited to be hosting this conversation today because uh, we want to hear from you. We want to know what things you guys have been doing specific to this topic and ways that we can learn from each other. And so on the next slide is our discussion agenda for the next hour. And you will see on the next slide, there it is, that we're first gonna talk about keeping connected while social distancing, so doing exactly what we're doing right now. How are we staying remote, but still staying, uh, talking to each other? And then after that, we wanna talk about staying safe and what does that look like, uh, whether it be online or in the interpersonal relationships that we are having. And then after that, we wanna talk about maintaining the relationships of those that you're quarantining with, um, being together in the same space, 24-7, uh, not being able to go out can be a challenge. So we want to talk about ways that we're doing that. And then number four, the last one there is looking at loneliness and isolation and mental health and thinking about individuals, especially in our community of individuals with disabilities that we serve, uh, those that are being isolated alone and how are we helping to keep them um, connected as well. So that's the game plan for what we're going to talk about today. So I encourage you to unmute yourselves when you have something to say and to talk about. Also use the chat function. If that's something you're more comfortable with or want to be able to type out what you say because we can capture that and use that in notes and then this is being recorded as Anna said and then we're also going to share notes to everyone who had registered as well um, once we can get those compiled. So really excited to get to talk to you all today and talk about what it is that um, is keeping us connected and so on the next slide this is my last plug of this is not a presentation this is something that we want to talk about with you together. So we really want to hear from you about strategies that you're finding are successful in your communities, um, certain platforms you're using or success stories or even some barriers that you all have been able to overcome. That's really the goal of today and what we're going to talk about. So with that being said, on the next slide, we're going to open it up for our very first topic of keeping connected while social distancing. And I'm going to turn it over to my co-chair, Julie, 
to help facilitate that discussion. Julie? Perfect, thank you. Um, so yeah, so we, I mean, we have a few topics that we wanna talk about, um, but first we want to kind of dive into social connectedness. Um, what strategies are working for you? Um, as we've talked to each other, um, we've had discussions across the network. Um, I know people are trying to come up with ways and strategies to stay connected. Um, so feel free to turn on your video, be part of this conversation. It's okay, We're, it's a very safe space. Um, use the chat box. Feel free just to at least introduce yourself. There's some names on here um, of new folks that I haven't met yet. Um, so take a minute, introduce yourself. Um, and then if you have good ideas or suggestions, please share with us what you're doing. Um, I know a few, week, a few weeks ago I was participating in the uh, Mental Health Developmental Disability, uh, the MHDD ECHO, um, and it's a partnership between um, a few of our USEDs. And um, hearing people talk about things that they were doing and, and some of the ones that I loved that were shared in that um, were um, just using video platforms like Zoom to be able to connect with clients. Um, they talked about how excited people were to see each other. They talked about, you know, the first like five, 10, 15 minutes of that is sometimes chaotic because everyone's so excited to see one another again. But it's been a really great way to connect um, individuals within these service agencies. Um, another fantastic idea was um, they were doing cooking. They were doing cooking classes um, where everyone had simple ingredients that they maybe already had at, the, at their house. And it was part of um, like their day hab services or part of their services that they were already doing, but they found a way to do it virtually. So that's kind of what I would love to hear from, from you. So I'm gonna stop talking for just a minute. Um, we might even take down this slide so we can see each other a little bit bigger. But what has been successful for you um, or agencies or um, partners that you have in your communities and um, or what are your challenges? Someone might have a good solution. So let's, let's, let's talk about this for just a few minutes. So I don't mind jumping in. <laughs> um, I was really hoping my colleague, Kate Paul from our, uh, and this is Lindsay Sobe. I'm with the, um, I'm co-chair of the sexual health SIG and I'm, um, talking to you from Oregon today. I work at the USED at Oregon Health and Science University that's based in Portland. However, I live in Astoria, so hello from Astoria, Oregon. Um, I, we work really closely with our local ARC chapter, um, the ARC of Multnomah Clackamas, and they, um, my colleague who works there, Kate Paul, wasn't able to be on the call today, so she shared a bunch of information with me so that I could share out with you. Um, they have been doing very regular, um, what she calls virtual hangs on um, Friday afternoons with the group of folks that she works with. Um, and she's created some really great documents that have ideas for like different activities they do. Um, she's also created a document just um, outlining some of the accessibility uh, aspects um, to help folks access Zoom and use Zoom. Um, so yeah, so it's been really successful. I think she's, her group has like grown and grown and grown every Friday. Um, sometimes they play music and dance, um, actually have a dance together on Friday afternoons. Um, sometimes they do a scavenger hunt. I think the scavenger hunts have been some of the most successful, exciting activities. Uh, so I'll just give you like a real quick example. Um, she shared she shared some PDFs with me, which I think when we're able to send out the notes, if we're able to send out some documents, um, I can include these. But um, for instance, like find something red, find something that you eat, find a tool an artist uses, um, something that makes you happy, um, an item from the bathroom. Um, so I think they just pause, give people you know three to five minutes. Um, and then everyone can bring, bring back uh, an item. And I know one of the things that they've been doing and also we've been trying to do when we're um, 
including self-advocates um, with mobility challenges is to give that list to folks ahead of time. So if we have a, a hang scheduled on Friday afternoon, we'll give um, the list to folks ahead of time so that they can um, gather their items ahead of time and, and contribute um, to make that more accessible. So yeah, just some, some great ideas. Um, another activity that she did with a self-advocate that was really cool was they went on a trip to New York together. So um, down to like creating a boarding pass and going to the airport and um, like exploring New York through YouTube videos and different pictures of different sightseeing. So they've been really active, um, you know, just basically doing all of this through, through virtual, through the Zoom platform. So yeah, wanted to share out what Kate from our local ARC has been working on. Yeah, uh, hi, I'm Jason. Uh, I work at uh, the Bird and Blad Institute, but I do some stuff with uh, LAD. I know LAD has been doing something like that, uh, what you were talking about with the art, but they do it every day. At, actually, at this time now, and they sometimes it's led by... Uh, it's led by different people, whether it's the people with disabilities themselves or somebody else. They, they have uh, different things. Yesterday was Family Feud. They had Marvel trivia. Somebody was showing some different things. I think every week, at today actually, Wednesday from 5 to 6, they have the planning meeting to do that. And I know they work with several other agencies in, in Cincinnati, Ohio, like the Ken Anderson Alliance who are doing like virtual trivia night or virtual bingo in some of the things. So I know there's, they, they have a virtual fitness classes. Uh, there, I know there's been a lot of different ways that uh, LAD, who I work with specifically, but then several agencies in Cincinnati have been uh, working with each other, but then also doing their own things uh, to make sure and making sure that the process is inclusive and including people with disabilities themselves to bring programmatic elements. And I think they also each day have just also chat sessions where there's no scheduled activity. It's just where people can talk to each other because that's also something people are in one of the meetings brought up is they wanted to just be able to talk. Sorry, thank you. Oh, don't be sorry. That's exactly what we want, Jason. I'm over here taking notes. We want to hear from you guys. I love to think that that's something that's going on in Ohio and some other really great ideas of, of I love the idea of having that planning meeting and ensuring that there's some advocates that are part of that, that part of the process and being leaders and leading those opportunities for social engagement. That's incredible. That's really great. Thank you so much for sharing. Hi, this is Faith Kelly. I'm with uh, UAA Center for Human Development in Anchorage, Alaska. I'm new to the SIG, so hi everybody. Um, and uh, I'll be working with our Friendships and Dating program, which is probably pretty familiar to a lot of you because Julie Atkinson uh, started that program about 12 years ago. So I'm really excited to be stepping into her shoes. And part of the, the challenge and sort of, uh, I guess, a silver lining to transitioning the program during this truly extraordinary time of COVID and life moving virtual is that we've made a huge shift in the past month, um, a huge lift on especially Julie's behalf of switching our curriculum for friendships and dating to virtual. So we actually just this week launched our virtual friendships and dating program. So we have a, a pilot where we're running with five different organizations where we're continuing the curriculum of the um, getting together and, and following through the steps of learning emotions, relationships, all the building all the way up through to sexual health, um, where we normally we would have community activities that would take place, but now we're having them as social opportunities that take place online. Uh, it's been really interesting to um, to connect and see what other organizations out there are doing, and we're using that to inform as we're uh, planning the new curriculum. Um, and yesterday, we actually had a great conversation with one of our pilot organizations where they're using Zoom for group dehabilitation um, at an agency here in Anchorage. 
and using breakout rooms and having different activities going on in each of the breakout rooms where people can make a choice. You know, maybe they're going to do a Zumba activity or maybe they're going to work on an art project with stuff that they have on hand at home. Uh, so it's really great to see people getting so creative. And uh, part of what's been really cool to see the friendships and dating virtual happen is that there were already things happening out there in our community that we just really tapped right into. The, the need was already there. And each organization that we reached out to was already really excited to uh, get in there and continue the thread of that connection that was made. So hi, everybody. I just wanted to introduce myself and throw in my two cents. No, it's perfect, Faith. Um, I think technology right now is a huge advantage um, that it's a great strategy that I think a lot of, a lot of us are leveraging. Um, the, the, unfortunately, the downside is that, um, you know, Lindsay kind of talked about with uh, an organ is talking about accessibility and are people able to engage? Do they have devices? Do they have hardware? Do they have broadband, right? In rural communities, um, you know, those are also challenges. So I think it's a, it's a moment where I think more people are turning to technology, but we just need to make sure that our, our, our folks out there, that they're able to, to tap into these opportunities. Any other thoughts before we move on to our next topic? Yeah, Jason. Well, I know, um, and with lab, some of the things is I think that there's people because people are still doing in-house services in some ways with being able to be held with obviously face mask and everything and people are being safe that I know for some of that people are being provided provided with computers or cell phones or things that they don't have it and also being help being able to connect to those services if needed to for people who need that with people in the house I mean it doesn't of course solve all the things that you're talking about and is still really important but I mean I think it's at least you know important to even think about those things sorry to hi um Jason I appreciate that this is Jillian Ober I'm in Columbus Ohio and that's um one of the things that um our programming um that that's been keeping us from being able to go you know full on virtual is that there's a significant percentage of our participants who don't have the the devices or the internet access let alone the training to be able to to connect virtually um so shy and i apologize i was a few minutes late so i'm sorry if you've already talked about this but shy of providing those things and you know um helping people to, you know, get uh, internet access, which is a little bit beyond the scope of what we're able to, I'm just wondering if anybody else has any ideas or solutions or, or if you've already shared that, I apologize, I'll catch up later, but for the folks that just can't connect virtually. So this is Austin Nidja. I'm in Kentucky with Lindsay Molas. Um, this was actually a question that came up um, with a, a doctor last week in a meeting I was in about how do we provide telehealth to people who don't have access to internet and devices. And the, the answer that was given was to see if there's any um, agencies or organizations in the area that have like assess, assistive technology or that's their focus because there might be some lending libraries or they might know how to get people in touch with, um, you know, getting internet set up at their house or getting access to assistive technology like an iPad so that they can enter the virtual world. But this, this is awesome again, but this also brings me to something that um, because of this shift in virtual, to the virtual world, I've actually been um, doing some work with an organization I work with in Portland. We have, a, or they have a social justice youth program, um, the Northwest uh, Disability Support. And um, so that is a program that is for high school and like young adults, so people in like college age. And what they were noticing is a lot of the, the, the 
um, youth with disabilities is they don't necessarily have the knowledge or the resources to be able to navigate social media. So while a, like people with like non-disabled peers are able to just kind of get on the internet and stay connected with people because they, you know, they've already learned the ins and outs of Instagram and TikTok or whatever it might be. So they're actually doing some work around let's take this program and expand it and involve it so that it's a community and it does and we're going to take it online but a big focus of that is going to be how do we support people with disabilities to learn the skills they need so that they can access the virtual world and they want to have a virtual hangout they can set up a zoom or they know how to do google hangout or set up a social media account so that they can be involved as much as possible but also learn the social norms of social media because oftentimes social norms are blurry on social media so making sure they understand you know what's appropriate on social media and how to set those boundaries thank you for sharing that austin i think that's a good point that we forget about i know in kentucky um, how we have our, our uh, centers for assistive technology that have those lending libraries that have access um, to equipment that could help some of our more um, you know, rural parts of the state be able to have some of those things. So hopefully that's really something others can look into. Maybe Jillian, that'll be an opportunity to look into the bio as well and see what kind of connections you can make for your participants to look into that. So thank you. And I think also what you, two, you just said too, Austin, and thinking about um, how do we support understanding those social norms and thinking about supporting individuals that might struggle to interact in in-person settings are now also needing to learn about that online safety and that really segues us nicely into our, our second topic of staying safe. We're working so hard to support people to stay connected and how do we do that virtually? It sounds like a lot of people are, are turning to Zoom as that platform or Google Hangouts and those have been successful ways in doing that. So that's, you know, I think that's the next step is how are we, we're doing it successfully, but how are we ensuring that it's safe? And I know, you know, a big, a big part of the friendships and dating curriculum is talking about some of those concerns. And so um, maybe Julie, you can lead us in, in that discussion and thinking about staying safe and how we can, can do that in this unique time. I love how Faith said the extraordinary times that we're experiencing. Yeah, I think that when it comes to safety, right, this is such a, a large topic and there's so many layers to it. Um, and like Austin said, yeah, navigating social media and a lot of these online platforms, you know, what are your privacy settings? Technology comes with a lot of um, boundaries, right? Um, you know, that's something that we've looked at in this virtual adaptation is how are we helping folks navigate safely through these online platforms? Um, so I think safety, in all the different layers. So I think one is certainly around technology, um, but it can also be used for safety planning. There are some great apps and, and online services that you, can, that you can tap into to create safety plans. Um, also in this time of um, social distancing and being at home and in quarantine, what if you're quarantined with um, an abuser? Um, you know, un unfortunately, we, we know that folks are victimized at higher rates and there are, are folks out there who are um, unfortunately in, in high risk situations and spending more and more time with that individual. So how can we keep them safe? Um, what can we do to help them with safety plans and have some strategies so that they um, are able to um, get through this time? Um, it, it's very difficult. Um, I know a few weeks ago, we sent out some resources, some webinars, um, and some um, handouts, um, articles related to this topic. But I would love to also hear, um, yes, Linda, I can definitely give you some, um, I will, I'll put them in the chat box while you guys are talking. Um, I know of two or three of uh, those safety planning apps, but um, they're pretty cool. You can pre-program information into it so that while you're out, you can always send someone a text message and just say, hey, I need some help. And it sends like a GPS location to where you're at. So there's some great um, technology can also be really good. So um, I would love to hear from folks as you are, because um, I know a lot of your work, work also touches on the safety component, because we've talked so much over the past few years about 
how sexual health and interpersonal violence are really connected and we have to be addressing these at the same time. Um, so what, what strategies are working? What challenges are you experiencing? Um, you know, what are your, your thoughts or what information do you have that would be beneficial in this time of um, this very unique time that we're in? And I know there's a lot going on in the chat box, so I'm gonna check that out while you guys start the discussion. This is Austin. I think one thing, and it, it kind of ties into safety because it's that access to information, is, I, is making sure that when we are creating resources and videos um, around safety or just in general, making sure that information is accessible and there's closed captioning and universal design principles implemented into it because that is going to increase understanding for individuals. Um, which in turn will hopefully, you know, relay into, you know, being safer online because they've got, they have access to that information. But if it's not made accessible, you know, that creates another barrier. I would also like to add on to that because I think universal design is a good point and going on to another disability studies is also while we want people to be safe and stuff there's also dignity of risk that, that we need to be able to afford people with intellectual and developmental disabilities I mean being online is is something that we all have some cult I mean we're all doing some things that are not always safe or exactly 100% so we can't be oh, being overly protective just because somebody has some label on them and not and not give it in, in us being taking risks that online it may not so I mean I think it's important that we also make sure that we're not overly protective of people and trying to stop them from doing things that everybody else is allowed to be able to do sorry not to I know that sorry Jason this is, you make a good point and so I have a question of like where where would you say is a safe place to draw that line because I wholeheartedly believe that there's so much dignity and risk but when you do hear a lot of stories of people with and without disabilities being taken advantage online with you mm -hmm. know scammers or people like committing fraud like you know, how, where would you say that you know yeah line is? I mean, I think that the, the, the line, I mean, I think it depends on the person thing. Some of the things is, is that the line is not a set line for each thing. And I think some of it's about education and being able to make, like you said, uh, documents and, and information and things accessible to the most amount of people and being able to individually try tail that to being able to understand w sort of where that person's coming from. And some of that might become with supported decision making as part of ways of being sort of on online criteria to be able to understand because you know again there, there, there's going to be people who are sexual who might be doing some things that you you know, I mean, online that are more adult and we can't stop. I mean, I don't think there's a way to take away. I mean, if we're going to be in the sexuality piece, I mean, it's about making sure that people understand and being able to work with it and try to mitigate the risk of anything bad, the, the, mo the least amount bad happening while still allowing those people, still allowing people autonomy and being able to take, to be able to make things, but also understanding what those implications of those choices mean. In, in to some extent in a way that's accessible. So I don't know if that helps or answers or- No, no, that, that helps so much. And I really appreciated that because that's definitely not an angle I've, I've thought about in the world of like virtual world, but it's something like dignity of risk is something I'm, you know, I'm, in regular times I, I'm constantly talking about, but so mm -hmm. I appreciate you bringing that up. Thank you. Thank you. Just thinking about accessibility too, this is Lindsay Sobe again from Oregon. Um, you know, thinking about the very negative consequence of sheltering in place and being at home of rates of interpersonal violence increasing, I just think about um, what domestic violence organizations might be doing to reach out to people, what pot potentially law enforcement might be doing to provide more support to people and working with those entities to make sure that they're inclusive of people with disabilities, that they're 
um, information is in plain language, that um, they're aware that the population um, of people with disabilities may, you know, have increased risks or challenges that um, just be kind of being aware of some of those different dynamics that um, might be at play for folks with disabilities and, and working closely with, with those entities. Because I know that it's, there's been some data out there that this is happening and there's been some response, um, but I don't know that we've heard much about whether that response has been accessible to the disability community. Hi, this, <clears throat> excuse me, this is Kelly Hartlieb. Um, I'm at the Center for Human Development in Anchorage and I work with Faith Kelly and, and Julie. And um, I'm just, you know, I don't know if I have um, any great answers, but I'm just thinking in terms of people who um, potentially are in a situation where they're experiencing domestic violence from their caregiver or somebody within their home and you know the um, how much more isolated they are during this these times and sometimes you know technology can be used as a weapon um, from people who are abusers and you know um, uh, limiting a person's access to technology or supervising their technology use and so I'm just trying to imagine how we can um, encourage the agencies that we um, interact with who support people with disabilities who maybe are more isolated than ever with fewer people coming in and out um, you know fewer trips out into the community how can we encourage people to have direct contact with individuals apart from maybe the people who are in their their you know instead of going through a um, kind of a chain of, of communication through their care caregiver just to um, to directly interact with people and to try to you know at least get some eyes on see if we can um, um, communicate with them to check in in some way about how they're feeling. Um, I just think the more uh, checking in from various people, you know, family, friends, natural supports, agencies, I think it's really um, important because people can, you know, it's, it's kind of a desperate situation to think about how isolated a person could be, especially right now, um, without people interacting with them as, as usual. Sorry, I didn't have my um, video on. This is me. <laughs> I'm Kelly here in Anchorage. I think maybe let's move on to the next topic, but if things come up related to these first two, put them in the chat box. Let's continue this conversation. I think there's definitely some really, really good points that are um, that are being brought up in ways that maybe we can think through. I mean, I have the answers today, right? But really planting the seeds of, especially with what you just said, Kelly, of thinking through how we can encourage the entities that we support and those agencies to really think through, um, you know, how we can help keep, keep people safe, right? Um, and then also in thinking about what our, our next topic is, and I think we'll come back to this staying safe when we look at number four, uh, but thinking about what are those relationships that we're maintaining at home. So those that are quarantining with others, whether that's your family members um, or, or in a group home, um, what, is, what does that look like? And so on the next slide, we'll see uh, some props about, or prompts, excuse me, about thinking of ways that we are working to support individuals that are in those living situations, or maybe those individuals are ourselves, right? Of keeping ourselves healthy and our relationships healthy with those that, um, that we're working to, to still enjoy their company, even though that's all that we've really been able to be around physically for the past several months. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Lindsay to help us lead the conversation and thinking through maintaining those relationships with those that are quarantining with others. Thanks, Lindsay. And Anna, if you want to mind advancing to the next slide, um, maintaining relationships. So just thinking about, we've, we've talked a bit about connecting with 
people outside the home um, through using Zoom and other virtual platforms, but there's also this um, fact that we, that many of us may be quarantining with other individuals, whether it's family members or roommates or um, folks who are quarantining within a group home. So just thinking about um, how do we maintain those relationships with the people that we can't get away from, that we, that we uh, don't, you know, our typical lives we have, uh, many of us have kind of breaks throughout the, the day um, from the folks that we live with. So how do we, um, how do we, how do we, and how do we support others that we're working with to, um, to maintain those relationships and to um, work through issues that might come up from, from being in close quarters with other folks. Maybe everybody's thinking like, wow, how do I do that? <laughs> this, one, this one might be the toughest one, um, right? All right. So I just, just thinking about um, group homes, I, I'm on a, um, uh, um, monthly call with some folks who work in different agencies um, in Oregon and just there's been some really creative ways that group homes um, have tried to kind of keep people distant like somewhat distant from each other but also doing some different games um, so just figuring out ways to help people kind of like interact in a fun and positive way um that may may encourage like the social distancing and encourage some of the the new hygiene practices that we have so thinking about those folks that might be um in like the group home setting or living with um yeah a group of people and how do you kind of maintain um you know fun and activity and physical activity when really the you know, the effort is to kind of stay sheltered in place and stay safe. Um, so yeah, there's there's been some kind of creative ideas coming around um, among some of those agencies in Oregon about just different activities and different ways that, you know, people can still kind of get outside and still interact with the outside world in the ways that are safe, um, depending on, you know, what our states are doing around that. Yeah, um, for I know Lad a little for for what they're doing. Even um, they they had the Lad Fit Challenge, uh, which was around when the Flying Pig was supposed to be in Cincinnati. So they had a week fitness type thing. They also, as part of their virtual, do some of the fitness. I know that uh, everyone who who lives in, who lives in the Lad housing or where, who does things with Lad also has two face masks that they're given from Lad because they've had people who have worked to, to, to sort of help do that. They've fostered some people's interest, whether it's coloring for some people or some people paint. I, I know even before then as part of some of the things. So fostering some of the interest and giving in activities and things, but also so, I mean, I think the, the sense of Ohio's had to, with, the, with, the, with being able to go out with a face mask and then also being able to explain why they, that they have two face masks and the importance of the face mask and, and, and sort of the process of being using the face mask, I think, has been something that's really important rather than just saying, just here's a face mask, wear it, I think, go, you know, being able to go over and talk about it and answer questions and they sort of, you know, mean, sort of instead of just, I think, an older model of in explaining sort of what's going on with the coronavirus in a way that, you know, is accessible about, about why it is that everybody's, they're not doing activities now and what it is that people could, thinking about things that could be done in the home or different sort of things. Sorry, I don't mean to talk too much because I know you said a lot of these things already. No, I love, Jason, that you brought up fostering relationships or, or fostering interests, right? Because I think that this is a moment where we need to like um, talk a lot about mutuality, right? You're, you only have 
so many people that you get to hang out with and you might need to try something new that they're interested in or, you know, that mutuality, that give and take in relationships. And I think this is a, um, a natural time when, when those are going to happen. And I also think communication is really important and being able to um, advocate when I need some time by myself or um, being able to talk with those around you so that, um, right, there's moments of frustration um, or moments where things are awesome and, and you're able to, to talk and have a really good time with those you're around. So I think um, some of the core relationship skills that um, are just need to be re-emphasized again and again about why they're important in this moment because, you know, we're in close quarters with one another and, and we want to be able to enjoy the time with the people that we're around. It'll make for a better experience for everyone. Absolutely. Um, and one idea, just as you all have been talking, that a, a, a resource that I'd like to share, and it came out of um, Jason Crandall from Western Kentucky University. It is an, a program called Bingo Size. So it was created more for elderly individuals and getting them to play bingo and also exercise. So it's bingo size. So the, the game is um, doing the bingo called out numbers, but each of the numbers on the card come with an exercise for older adults to do to build their, their stamina, risk of falling, reduction, those kinds of things. And um, prior to the pandemic, Jason had started working on there to be an app version of that. And so now there is an app version of the bingo size. So being able to utilize uh, Zoom technology to interact with each other, but then also log into the bingo size app and still get to play the game and be physically fit. And I know that he's also working on additional modules for some education pieces. And so I know he's working on a health education one. Um, and then I'm also assisting him on a sexual health educational module, which will be really, really interesting as we can get that going. So, um, you know, the, the educational modules might not necessarily be finished just yet, but I know that the Bingo Size app already exists. So just being able to utilize that as an existing platform and then thinking about how we can can do that. Um, I don't know much about other than that that's the name of it and what it takes to, to access it, but I think if we're able to support individuals doing that through Zoom, um, and I've seen the app in um, being able to play it on some calls, and it's really, really straightforward. It's, it's really simple, but it's also got some universal design in it with videos that show the exercises. So that might be something that you guys can look into or be interested in uh, in the bingo size app because it's been pretty cool as, as I've learned more about it. And then as we continue to develop a sexual health piece, I'll obviously keep the SIG informed as to, as to what that looks like or, or loop you guys in where necessary. We've just started those conversations. So yes, thank you, Austin, for adding that link to the, to the chat box. Does anybody have anything else they're thinking about, about maintaining relationships with those that we're quarantined with? Um, I can add something. So yeah. as a person who experiences a mental health diagnosis, this obviously a lot of the things that I typically rely on to stay kind of calm have been removed because of the shelter in place. So a big thing is like making sure that I'm trying to do my best to take care of myself so that that doesn't fizzle into my, my relationship with my boyfriend who I live with and also just setting those boundaries and recognizing like we're not always going to see eye to eye on like the response that the world has taken to COVID and you know some days we're frustrated and trying to find those boundaries of like not making it always like we're only going to talk about COVID and all the negative stuff in the world and trying to find those positive things to, to balance out the situation and um, you know keep our, our relationship positive I think has been like a really important but also really challenging thing to do is not let the stress take hold and then cause tension. So thank you for sharing that Austin. I wonder if anybody on the call knows of any resources um, or has seen anything that would help others 
you know, be able to do those kinds of things that Austin is talking about, about ways to, to look at, at the positivity or, or how to um, establish boundaries so that we're not only talking about COVID. Um, has anybody seen anything like that that would be a good resource to share that could help others that might not have those coping mechanisms already set in place? This is Jillian in Columbus. I don't, I haven't seen anything in terms of um, anything online or in print, but just in talking with people for the last couple months. Um, I have a friend who, um, for her, it's helpful to um, impose some more structure on the week. And I think it's actually helpful for me too, to, to schedule time and to set aside time. Like Austin, you were saying, like we can't talk about COVID all the time. Um, so to kind of set aside time specifically for, um, maybe for you for a, a at home date night, you know, with your boyfriend or, um, you know, Saturday morning is going to be my time alone or, um, but to whatever that schedule might look like for you and maybe everyone is busy enough, but for people who have all of this free time, um, you know, looking at a, a weekly, um, you know, chart or, or some kind of structure that can um, give people some kind of rhythm and um, sense that, you know, hey, today's Saturday <laughs> or today is Wednesday, you know, um, but, but to schedule, schedule time, you know, in communication with whoever you're quarantining with, but to schedule those, those times that, um, you know, you might need and for, uh, you know, some people, um, they may need help in, you know, supported decision making there and what is, you know, what would be a, a good, a good way, um, you know, to use this block of time or whatever, but just, that was just the first thing that came to mind. And that's a really good point because that's something that my mom has been navigating because I have three younger brothers and two of them ex have had um, early child, adverse childhood experience experiences and so they're adopted and then I have a brother with down syndrome and so that anxiety is manifesting differently and so the, and they also don't have the words to say I'm feeling anxious or I'm confused like so you know her trying to like provide that flexibility but also like recognizing like they need that structure so it's like this really fine line of you you know you want that structure but also recognizing that like we are in a like kind of a crisis right now. And so being flexible and recognizing that there are going to be bumps along the way and like, that's okay. And like, you know, we work through them and we all love each other and we're going to figure it out. But I think, you know, I, I really like your idea of like scheduling that, like that alone time or that time with, with that person to have a date night or something or like a movie night or something would be like really helpful. Hi, this is Tanisha Clark. Can you hear? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, but with my daughter, I've started watching some of her shows with her and it kind of builds conversation. Um, so that's also kind of just stepping into her world. Um, but having conversations and talking about the show just kind of deflects, I guess, from her missing her friends and all of those things. And um, I've actually, I've seen a couple of books, but I haven't purchased any, but I did look online just for, cause it's hard to talk to a teenager um, and be in a space all the time. But um, I found like some prompt, you know, some additional questions that there are things that you would typically use to like get to know people, but I've tried to reframe them in a way to just kind of create conversations and get to know her on a different level during this time. So that's something that I have been doing to try to maintain uh, or build a relationship with my daughter. So um, for me, I'm actually an autistic person. One of the reasons um, 
one of the when I when we asked in the profile, I work at Syracuse University, Burr and Blatt, and do stuff with Inclusive You, but I'm doing stuff with an organization in Cincinnati is because some of the reasons is that I moved back to Cincinnati to live with my parents during this because I wasn't getting support services in New York. So I, I, as an autistic person, I think it's been really interesting to move back home and sort of how, you know, I mean, in, 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 as much as I love my parents, just trying to build boundaries and be there just with each other, but then also on both ends, try to be able to reject each other's space and be able to be mindful of, you know, not just barging in or not just because they're working and I'm working and so I mean I think even just to communicate you know when there's times where I'm more articulate or less articulate or we all have anxiety so just in general as a, as a family so even just being able to communicate or sometimes realizing that maybe sometimes arguments aren't going to be solved right away. Maybe it's sometimes giving some space to it and then talking about it later. Sorry, I don't mean to make this this whole diet, big, long monologue, but I think those are just things I've noticed as I've been, as an autistic person myself coming home, been thinking about with those sort of boundaries and stuff. Thank you, Jason. Those are excellent suggestions. Um, considering we only have about 10 minutes left, I think um, I'll go ahead and just move us along to the next topic, just so that we have some time to talk about, um, you know, also thinking that there's a lot of folks out there who may be quarantining or sheltering in place by themselves, um, or even if they're not, that loneliness and isolation and issues around mental health are real and happen and um, knowing the data out there around loneliness and isolation that is, you know, already a, a major issue for people living with disability, that this crisis is, um, you know, accelerating that for people and making it even more difficult. So how do we support people who might be quarantining, quarantining um, alone? And we've already talked about some really great ideas around supporting mental health, but maybe if others have um, more to share about um, supporting mental health and and relationships during this time. So this is Austin again, and something that my therapist actually recommended for um, me, but I think could be helpful for everybody, is it goes back to that scheduling piece, but she has me scheduling um, out like time for like some level of physical activity, but also just stuff around um, like prioritizing my mental health care so like set like before I like dive into the day or whatever like a, like scheduling some time for me to just check in with myself and that's been really helpful because when you're living and working and whatever like all in the same place at all times there, it's really hard to like have that structure sometimes and so having that calendar or that schedule has been really helpful and um, maybe it would be helpful to people who are living alone as well. Hi, this is Scott at ID. It's located at the University of Southern Mississippi. I was going to share for our group um, during COVID-19 in order to continue to engage them because these individuals, they do need their social engagement. They need their friends. So what we started using is a program called Discord. It's a um, database-based program that is free, that can run off of multiple devices, but um, it's a way to be able to continue communicating with each other because you can talk through text channels, you can talk through voice chat, so actually speaking, you can use GIFs, pictures, videos, and some of the things we've been doing, we've been actually been hosting events for our group. We do trivia twice a week. We've been doing Dungeons and Dragons on there virtual scavenger hunts, sharing, doing a movie night where we were using Disney Plus and we shared a movie that our individuals get to work at. So, and there's other things that we're continuing to work more so with that, but it's been one of the things that's been really good for our members and that has gauged them the most during this time. Um, I know my supervisor submitted a article that to AUCD. If anybody's interested in that, I can send that to you. Yeah, that'd be great, Scott, if this, you might be able to add that to the chat box or um, if the time doesn't allow for you to do that today, if you can email that directly, we'll add it to the notes to send out to everybody that's on the, 
a call today and that they've registered because I think that's an incredible resource of thinking about going back to how do we support people with varying levels of technology um, understanding or application technology devices themselves. And I think that's a, a great opportunity to explore that as an option if that's a big concern. So thank you. Sure, no problem. I think I can put the link on there. Yep, Julie already the discord.com is the is the um, in the link in the chat box. Um, but if you've got the article, that would be great too. I'm sure some of us would like to check that out. I shared a link in the chat to a, a video. Um, shout out to Erin Taylor. I think you're on the call today. Um, she and another team member uh, created a, a video. It's a voiceover PowerPoint that's on YouTube about some tips about how to be social while physically distancing. It's really great. So I think that is we're coming up on, on our, our last five minutes together. Um, with one of the efforts that, that I work on for the state of Kentucky, I, I run our CDC Disability and Health Grant, and one of our, our main deliverables is the creation of resources. So, you know, I just have to ask with all the things that have been brought up on the call, what are the resources that maybe we're missing? Is there, do, you know, a lot of people are focusing on hand washing videos, right? Or, or thinking through these public health messages around COVID, but in the population that we serve, are there resources that, that need to be created on helping to support people to understand how to access Zoom platforms? Um, you know, things that if you really think about self-advocates and the individuals that we work to support, is there other things that we wish that someone could have brought to the table today? Thank you, Erin, for um, sending the video of how to, to stay physically connected with social distancing in the chat box as well. Awesome. Well, if anybody has any ideas that, that spark out of this conversation that you don't think about within the next couple minutes, um, definitely email them. Julie has, has shared my email and uh, the other Lindsay's email in the chat box. Um, you know, we definitely uh, want to be able to create these resources. A big effort from the sexual health SIG that we serve for AUCD is making sure that we share resources across the network. So if you joined us today and you're not a part of the SIG, we definitely encourage you uh, to connect with us. Join our listserv by going to AUCD um, website and searching for the sexual health SIG. And we love to keep you connected with us and to receive updates. And in the future, we'll definitely be sending out the notes um, and the uh, recording from this call will also be there on that AUCD SIG webpage, and we would love to stay connected with you and continue this conversation and really be able to focus on the creation of those resources and uh, supporting each other and staying connected and maintaining relationships. Um, so yeah, and thank you, Scott, for adding the link there to the um, to your coordinator YouTube channel. Um, thanks to everybody for being a part of the the chat today, and. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe, and we'll hopefully talk to you again soon.